You've just heard a brief passage from Fantasia of Pollen on the Breeze, which is the first movement of my piece, Primrose Path. There's a version for chamber ensemble as well, but that was the original computer-generated version. I'll say something more about it later, but for now, I've come to the Goethe House, the Brock townhouse in the middle of Weimar, where Goethe lived on and off for almost 50 years. I'd like to go inside. Actually, before I go, I'd like to thank the Classic Stiftung Weimar for the opportunity to video inside their buildings, and especially here at the Goethe House. It's a fascinating place. Here I am. This is Goethe's study. This is his desk. It was his desk. This is where Goethe wrote the literature and poetry that goes a long way to defining not only Weimar's identity, but the heart of all German culture. And it's also where he wrote several books and articles on science theory. I'd like to show you his library with 5,000 volumes and his rock cupboard just over there. Goethe had collected almost 18,000 rock samples by the time of his death, which was the largest private collection of minerals in the world at that time. These are just a few of them. I'll look at Goethe's literature in a little more depth later, but for now I want to recognise how he was also in an excellent position to develop his knowledge in many areas of natural science. Both equally attract me nowadays, he wrote in his poem Nature and Art, and thus it was he became involved in botany by way of his responsibility for the ducal forests. He became fascinated about geology as a result of the attempts to reopen a silver mine at nearby Ilmenau, hence the rock collection and he became interested in light and colour theory through his involvement with others at the University of Jena. Goethe was responsible for the university administration, which included making professional appointments. This is how he was able to bring leading experts on Kantian thought to the Jupiter. In this episode, I'd like to look at approaches to Kant's transcendental idealism in the modern era, in particular in the world of science. But while I'm here in the Goethe house, I should also consider Goethe's response to the same. What I find most interesting about Goethe's science is not the empirical research itself, collecting and classifying rocks, for instance, fascinating as mineralogical classifications might be, but the abstract and reflective ideas surrounding the science. Goethe wanted to understand the workings of nature, all of nature, from its physics and chemistry to its biology. But he also wanted to understand the meaning of nature. The physics textbook that our diploma program students use at school, which I won't name and shame, claims that German science avoided experimentation during Goethe's era. This is completely wrong. Goethe and his peers were as committed to empirical evidence as much as anywhere, but they were also interested in speculating on metaphysical semantics. Goethe was not only interested in the new theories developed by natural science, and not only by Shakespearean tragedy, but also by an idea that was introduced to him by some of the figures he'd appointed at the university, a secularised adaptation of Spinozian pantheism. This influence was important because it contradicted Kant, it argued that nature is not derived of mind, but is the same thing as mind. Accordingly, 
He took a holistic anti-specialization stance in his work, approaching nature not as if it was subdivided into discrete parts, not as the equivalent of a categorization of rock types, fascinating as that might be, but as something that was active and alive. He perceived the need to begin with the whole and thereafter move to the parts. This is a Juno room, in my opinion the most beautiful room in the Goethe house. There are many paintings and sculptures and other mementos representing Goethe's broad range of interests, although no rocks. But this is where he would have told visitors of his motivation to contest Newtonian-based ideas in the life sciences and to reject the notion that life exists in a fixed state, forever the same, like the unmovable laws determining physics and chemistry. He pointed to evidence of the variety of form and structure to be found in plants and animals, and the many adaptations to be found in species around a certain core essence. He argued that nature is not a mechanical phenomena, present and eternally constant, but continually adapting and changing organically. Every creature has its own self-sufficient role in nature, and every component part of a creature's anatomy also has its own self-contained purpose. But these are not immovable. They're constantly developing in a dynamic manner. It's a theory that's a precursor of the principles of evolution. Moreover, Goethe looked to the relationship between the observer and the observed between he or she in front of the camera and he or she behind it, as existing in a dynamic relation, forever in flux. If nature changed from one moment to the next, then so did the humans who perceived themselves to be looking on upon it. He had a lot of sympathy with the new post-Kantian ideas on identity. Organics in nature is dialectics in the mind. Indeed, the very purpose of science as a discipline is the gradual metamorphosis of the scientist's modes of thought and understanding. Goethe had initially been impressed with the Copernican reversals proposed by Kant pertaining to mind and matter, and he frequently found new applications for the principle. He'd also been particularly enervated by Kant's notion of the transcendental unity of apperception, which represented the integrating force behind nature, even if it couldn't be experienced by a human observer directly. However, in time, following discussion with Schelling in particular, who I'll introduce later, he'd grown concerned about some of the implications of Kant's epistemology and began to disassociate himself from the notion that all cognition is conditioned by the a priori. He grew increasingly convinced that the idea of a transcendental inversion of mind and matter, replacing the notion of cognition conforming to objects with the idealist notion of objects conforming to cognition, did not satisfactorily represent the dynamic attributes of either the natural world or the mental equivalent. Goethe acknowledged that art and literature and nature shared an inner life emanating from the mind, and he was enthusiastic about the notion that the study of nature provided insight into the mind. However, he was uncomfortable with the notion that knowledge might by definition be unable to grant access to things in themselves, and it might reveal only phenomena determined a priori by the transcendental capacities of mind and perception. His doubts were shared by others here in the dining room of this house and in the nearby university town of Jena too. Many were concerned by the question mark left hanging over the validity of science, given nothing could be ever known for certain. And furthermore, they asked, just as modern anti-realists ask today, if the premise is that cognitive structures pay a large part in defining mental representation to the extent it's not possible to know the reality beyond cognition, how is it possible to know that cognitive structures prevent the mind from knowing reality? How can we justify transcendental realism anyhow? The first commentators on Kant's work did not have a solution to this, and it bothered them tremendously. Actually, it bothered Kant too. Most likely it was the talk of the town in every tavern within a hundred kilometers of here. Probably it was. They held the transcendental principles, the prominent role given to the mind, in high regard, but they wanted to present their theory as truth. They sought a foundational justification for their approach. They wanted to present the idea that a fact is not possible in factual terms.
They couldn't reconcile their idealist principles with their desire for absolutism, whereby if there are no facts is true, then there are no facts is false. Every individual that Goethe offered a teaching position to in nearby Jena seemed to have a different solution to the same problem. And I'll look at the ideas of Fichte and Schelling and Hegel in particular in later episodes. But for the rest of this episode, I'd like to step forward 200 years to the modern era and look at how refutations of Kant's transcendental idealism continue apace today. I've come to the children's room to try to explain. In one sense, a system of transcendent epistemics that places an a priori cognition before the cognitive faculties of reason and empirical judgment deprives the mind of the opportunity to know anything objectively. It defines all knowledge, even scientific and mathematical knowledge, as subjective. Yet at the same time, it claims an authoritative, objective perspective of itself. It's a system that says everything is subjective except the system itself, which takes on the role of supreme arbitrator, unassailable, the equivalent of a supreme god. Modern epistemologists also continue to point out the other paradox at the heart of transcendental idealism. If we cannot know anything for real, then how can we know that we can't know anything for real? Actually, Kant had an answer to this, which is rather convoluted, and I won't go into it now, but it wasn't convincing. If these are analytical refutations, there are also hermeneutic objections too, in particular pertaining to the ahistoricity of a necessary structure of mind. This is a position that Goethe might have had sympathy with in that it rejects a rigid determination of nature. It says that if the mind is constructed based on experience, then the very idea of a transcendental mind must be a convention defined by and relative to cultural circumstances. Both Kant and Goethe had, in different ways, taken the first steps in exploring an issue that is extremely contentious in our modern age, and therefore impeccable ground for an international school director to explore, that of fundamentalism which I should probably call foundationalism, not only as it pertains to religion, but also to raw facts. To illustrate this matter, I'd like to turn to the work of another writer-cum-scientist, albeit of a different kind, Richard Dawkins. He's a biologist and able to explain recent developments in biology very well. His writing is lucid and entertaining, and I have four or five of his volumes at home. In his book, The Greatest Show on Earth, he outlines the range of factual evidence available in support of evolution. He also identifies various facts pertaining to the components of natural selection that drive evolution, including the matter of selective breeding. He examines, among other things, the strategies used by the female to attract a suitable partner. He calls the role of seduction in natural selection, not without a sense of humour, the primrose path, the music at the beginning of this episode was a piece of mine, as I've already mentioned, also called Primrose Path. It's based around Dawkins' book. The music addresses the same themes as those in the book, not in a cognitive sense, because the expression of non-musical representations in music can only ever be metaphorical, but by playing with abstractions that exemplify a personal experience of the natural world, and also that typify the humour that Dawkins brings to his writing. Here's another example from the fifth movement, Bees to the Violet Blossom. The reason I introduce Dawkins to the discourse now in relation to an inquiry into the nature of justification is that the author takes a clear stand on one side of the foundationalist relativist divide and, without seeking to justify this stance, is very patronising to those on the other side. 
Facts are facts, absolutely. Foundationally, fundamentally, and any kind of Kantian epistemic constraint is ludicrous. I don't mean to imply anything about my position, but Dawkins is a methodological approach that represents the opposite of the critical anti-realist approach to inquiry I'm attempting here. Actually, the reason he wants to explain biology and evolution by natural selection to the general public in the first place is because, despite living in a world of scientific discovery and technological innovation and greater levels of education, many people's lives are grounded in the same notions of nature as those of their pre-Newtonian medieval forebears. He points out that surveys show, for instance, that 40% of Americans believe the world to be less than 10,000 years old mostly justified not by factual evidence, but by religious revelation. He feels obliged to meet the challenge of their arguments, even though I'm sure he realises it's not possible to convince when people are so committed to a cause. He's frustrated by the narrow-mindedness and the subjugating and disenfranchising effect these beliefs have on others, particularly children. He demonises those who refute the notion of natural history based on empirical fact as the 40 percenters and as a threat to civilization. Perhaps it's the 52 percent Brexit patriots that ought to be ridiculed instead and their recourse to stripping themselves and thereafter the young of their nation of their European citizenship for the cause of bigotry and undermining their standard of living in the process. Although it's not difficult to sympathise with Dawkins' concern too when watching US political debate. However, Dawkins also demonises intellectual arguments that question his epistemic assumptions, which underpin the objectivity of the theory of natural selection. Neither Kant nor Goethe would have made this mistake, but he says, Influential philosophers tell us we can't prove anything in science. Note the humour now used as contempt. Even the undisputed theory that the moon is smaller than the sun cannot, to the satisfaction of a certain type of philosopher, be proved. His point is that the theory of evolution, like the relative size of the sun and moon, is a fact. It's not a mere hypothesis. It's as true, as concrete, as objective and as fundamental or foundational as anything can be. It's a true fact that I'm holding a microphone in my hand right now. It's a true fact that natural selection drives evolution and that this explains the development of life on Earth. His point is that, as facts, these notions are incontrovertible. They cannot be challenged on intellectual grounds. Therefore, it's appropriate to demonise those who suggest otherwise. Dawkins is an emeritus fellow of New College, Oxford and it's surprising that he's so vitriolic towards his colleagues, many of whom must place great respect in the tradition refuting metaphysical realism that encompasses Plato's forms, Descartes' dualism, Kant's transcendental idealism, and more recently Thomas Nagel's What is it like to be a bat? which I'll look at later. He defends this demonization of intellectual discourse by suggesting that arguments are liable to be misunderstood by the public. He used to be the Oxford University Professor for Public Understanding of Science, after all. He says that epistemic questions of justification are likely to lead to the general public, and especially the 40 percenters, to think it's reasonable to believe that humans once rode bareback on dinosaurs. I recognise it may be an incontrovertible social fact that people manipulate ideas to meet their own dogma. This is Kant's characterization of reason and is a process described in our own time by game theory, which is part of evolutionary psychology, which in turn looks to natural selection. Nevertheless, I reject the idea that this course that is easily manipulated, such as this, should be kept away from the public domain due to the danger it might be misconstrued. It's a rather patronising approach. So, I'll say this openly. There are different ways of interpreting the meaning of the word fact. And the realist approach taken by Dawkins to explore empirical knowledge is very different to the idealist approach taken by those such as Kant and Goethe exploring the relationship between mind and what mind knows about nature. One methodology enables the refutation of ideas that lacked foundational support, while the other refutes the entire notion of foundational support. However, it's interesting that both share a commonality. From Dawkins' viewpoint, the absolute condition of fact 
and from Kant's viewpoint, the absolute condition of the impossibility of an absolute condition of fact. Despite having set out an anti-realist starting point, which embodies scepticism about any form of absolute condition, and despite the refutation of Dawkins' approach to factuality, the critical component of my approach demands I continue to consider realist arguments. And given that realist justifications typically point to reductionism and thereafter physics, I'd like to look very briefly at factuality, and by implication foundationalism and fundamentalism, in terms of different approaches to quantum mechanics. In the same way that Goethe sought to reach beyond empirical evidence to understand the meaning of nature, so science of the past century has done the same. The standard model of particle physics describes the various subatomic particles that have been detected or theorised and some of the forces binding them, notably the electromagnetic force, which we'll look at later, and also the strong and weak nuclear forces. It's been complemented by expressions pertaining to the meaning of quantum mechanics. However, Rather than justifying realism or factuality, the most influential account of particle physics in the last century, based upon the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics proposed in the mid-1920s by the Danish physicist Niels Bohr and the Bavarian Werner Heisenberg, has been an anti-realist one. The science of the universe is described as fundamentally indeterministic, probabilistic and ultimately subjective. Alyssa Ney said, for Bohr and Heisenberg, to appreciate the shift required from classical to quantum theory required giving up a fully realist account of physical systems. The quantum state describes only what was or could be observed. If electrons spinning around the nucleus of an atom possess discrete energy and orbital levels that are excited by quantum packets of energy from light, from photons, whereby there can be no intermediary steps between these levels, then these electrons must literally leap instantaneously from one state or one orbit to another without any intermediary positions, as if faster than the speed of light. If this discontinuity seems implausible, then Heisenberg's uncertainty principle is even more incredible. It outlines how it's not possible for science to measure both the location of an electron and its momentum at the same time. If one of these parameters is established with any degree of certainty, it's not possible to know the other. Most importantly, the representation of these orbits, or quantum states, by way of vectors in configuration space, as described by Heisenberg's matrix mechanics, is probabilistic. Given all the variables, it's actually not possible to define a particular electron as existing in a particular position and travelling at a particular speed. Only that readings pertaining to position and momentum possess a higher or lower degree of probability, expressed by a wave function. Knowledge of the wave attributes of light reaches back before the 20th century by way of phenomena such as the double slits experiment, whereby monochromatic light can be seen diffracting like a wave through slits onto a screen behind, creating an interference pattern and phases, the crest and trough amplitudes magnifying or cancelling each other out. I'm sure Goethe would have been aware of this experiment. However, more recently, advancing technology has shown that using particles such as electrons in the same way produces the same phenomena but with three peculiar effects. Firstly, each electron passes through a single slit as if it's a particle, and not both slits as it would do if it's acting like a wave, yet it still creates a wave effect. Secondly, each individual electron moves according to the probability defined by the wave function. Erwin Schrödinger called this phenomena entanglement. It's as if all the electrons know what their fellow electrons will do in different time and space. I'll introduce his cat in a later episode. And thirdly, if an electron passing through a slit is measured with a particle detector, it stops behaving like a wave altogether and instead acts like a particle. It goes straight on, rather than adjusting its direction according to the probabilistic wave function. It's not a primrose path, but it's certainly another paradoxical one. The very act of measurement affects the result of the experiment. It introduces subjectivity, the role of the observer, into empirical data. According to this interpretation of quantum theory, the transition between the probabilistic world, such as that defined by a wave, and the empirical world happens at the moment a state is measured, 
a phenomena called the collapse of the wave function. It describes how the quantum world, described by probabilities, becomes a macroscopic world of rocks and crystals at the very moment of human interaction, when it's perceived by human subjectivity. Humans exist in the dimensions of time and space, as defined by classical and relativist mechanics. Objects exist or they don't. A rock or a crystal, for instance, or a lattice arrangement of particles in a solid, or even a molecule, doesn't half exist and half not exist. Furthermore, humans perceive themselves as existing in a world that will continue to exist if they were not there to observe it. Water doesn't materialise into water only when humans subjectively perceive it, at least according to realist common sense. There's a mismatch between predictions made by the dynamics of quantum states, as outlined by the Copenhagen interpretation, and the macroscopic world. Ney said, the trouble is that what the laws of quantum mechanics predict is very strange and, more importantly, appears to be in conflict with what we actually observe when we take measurements. Anyone who wants to understand quantum mechanics as a theory of our world must do something to reconcile what the theory predicts with what we observe. But not to worry. If the most influential interpretation of quantum mechanics has been an anti-realist one, there have also been realist alternatives, including the work of Einstein and Schrödinger, and most notably the Many Worlds interpretation, or MWI, developed by Hugh Everett and others since the 1950s, which rejects the notions of randomness and discontinuity and of a collapsing wave function. Instead, it postulates that every possible scenario outlined by wave function probabilities represents an actual reality. It posits not a universe, but a multiverse, encompassing every possible quantum state, which is a lot. In other words, in seeking to account for the indeterminism associated with phenomena described in terms of probability, it describes reality as akin to a tree with multiple branches and multiple roots, with an infinite number of histories and futures. It addresses the subjective appearance of wave function collapse by way of quantum decoherence. The multiverse comprises a supposition of many non-communicating quantum worlds. I'll look at probability again later and ask whether it's a component of causality, or a consequence of observation, or of underdeterminism. But for now I must emphasise the need to critically examine all assumptions, not just realist ones. If I'm going to justify an educational pedagogy, or the legitimacy of an opera about Iphigenia in contemporary culture, or the place of the Weimar thesis in modern thought, it's not going to be enough to come up with a list of facts or criteria. I'll need to examine the assumptions underpinning those facts or criteria, just as Kant and Goethe attempted to do 200 years ago. Otherwise, any claims to truth I make are going to be empty. Perhaps Kant and Goethe were so open-minded in their approach to knowledge because they sought a justification that encompassed aesthetic facts as well as those of natural kinds. That's what I'm going to try to do too. But for now, here's a little more from the Primrose Path, this time the fourth movement, with its title taken from Dawkins' book, Proboscis to a Tubular Nectary. Thank <laughs> you. 